Hi, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you to the organizers uh, for putting this really amazing gathering together. Um, I, uh, I'll be talking about um, a friend of mine who passed um, in 2021. Uh, this paper is called Replaying the Record, Grief's Temporalities. The collective losses of the pandemic have radically transformed the public dialogue and practices of mourning. And yet queer individuals and communities have long improvised their own methods of honoring and recognizing one another in life and death. In this paper, I explore artistic legacy oriented around death passages and grief guides left behind by a friend. Uh, my friend Julia Eisenberg passed away on March 11, 2021, 63 days after a transplant to fight a rare gene mutation. I don't have enough time to tell you who she truly was, but I described her recently uh, in Jewish currents as rock star, scholar, archive lover, linguistic lush, wild queer weirdo, anarchist, anti-fascist, lay cantor. And because of um, today's Supreme Court ruling uh, in the US where I'm zooming in from, I want to also add uh, that she was trained to perform abortions in her late teens and early 20s. Um, she was a New Yorker through and through, a community builder, visionary, teacher, and eternal student. Julia was fearless. She could convince you to be as well. And damn, she had style. On the program for her funeral, we described her in this way. Her memory is a long note sung with your whole chest in gold. The grief of losing her began years before that day, and it continues to unfold. One of her many bands was called Red Pocket, the combined force of Julia and cellist and vocalist Marika Hughes. I listened to their song, Never Two Weeks, on repeat. They sing about replaying the weeks of grief spent mourning a breakup, and I use this as a starting point to make sense of the way time passes in Julia's wake, to the sound of her own voice, and arranged around the community structure she built to hold all of us after she was physically gone, including a description of the funeral she wanted, including a public archive of songs, photographs, videos, and research. And then there are those other practices we improvised and objects we shared, engaged study of her Omer bot writings, gold sunglasses, a plastic octopus from her childhood bedroom, a diorama of a YWCA locker room. Practicing memorialization is an ongoing process and a public feeling, as well as an act of intimacy between the mourner and the mourned. How do queer deaths succeed the grave and continue to shape our lives? I will first play the song through an audio share to immerse us in one of Julia's many musical sounds. And then in my paper, I will take us through a slow paced, close reading of the work and use this as a springboard for contemplating the intimacy of grief, giving up and going on, repeating. Um, and I'm gonna put a few links in the chat that I think will be passed over to YouTube. Um, these are uh, the lyrics of the song for accessibility I put up on uh, Genius, a link to the album itself, um, because it's not streaming anywhere. And then also links to learn more about Julia's work and Marika's work. Um, and so, and then after playing the song, I'll resume. Um, and earlier today, I read this piece to my ex-wife and shared my fears that maybe some of the references are too personal or won't make sense. And um, her response seemed worth sharing. She said, it is, it's like music. A lot of times you don't know the specifics of it, but you know that they're singing about someone they love and someone they're grieving. And I think it will still resonate. So I hope that's true. Um, the song is um, a little under four minutes and um, I've been reassured I'll, uh, someone will tell me if the audio quality is too bad uh, for people to hear and, and then I'll stop. But otherwise, um, yeah, it should be a little under four. Here I go. Uh, um, hopefully that sound was okay. Um, the other night, three people had dreams of you, 
but I dreamed of W, a friendship that broke the same week I lost you. We match the others from what I'm told, sitting, talking, and laughing as if nothing had changed at all. Dear Julia, part of me wishes I shared my dream with you instead, but part of me is also scared. I wonder if you're here all the time or only when you want to be, or if the way that presence relates to you now is something I can't know until I'm over there too. Time will tell. Never two weeks starts with Scott Amendola, marking time on the hi-hat, monotonous, consistent, sentenced. Next, the cello enters with the voice, with that same dragging pace. The voice is amplified, doubled. It's Julia and it's Marika crooning an announcement of the first week of grief. The repetition and drag make sense. They're counting the passage of time. They're blurring the days with vices. Time's moving and it's also going nowhere. Then in week four, a letter arrives. The epistle scrambles the linear march of time and we're back to week one on replay. And then thrown forward to week five. It's all happening so slow that we almost believe we can step off the track and its feelings anytime we want to. But actually we can't. Exit willingly that is, and I don't want to. Conceptually, the song attends to romantic and sexual grief. In its spirals and zigzags, the dependability of time unravels. Concretely, the song never makes it past week five. The arrival of a letter in week four heralds the slippages of contact that we can't protect ourselves against, disembodied or not. We don't even know what's in the letter before we're tossed back across the time map to week one starting from scratch, crying three times a day. In week five, the sound accelerates, it's urgent. There are the intoxicating feelings of missing and hungering and being so fucking brave and weak at the same time. But that's before she read the letter. I don't know what's in it, I never asked. But I assume she read it because at this point in the song, now she's angry. For such a serious track, it surprises with a moment of mimicry. The author of the letter and of her grief appears to make a claim about their own loss, to which Julia and Marika sing, boo-hoo and too bad. Before I can fully enjoy my sudden laughter, Julia fires back in rare quiet tones, I want to die. And then there's a crescendo. We find out that this person is not the limit of her loss. The song is also mourning the loss of potential futures. In this case, a baby. In our case, more time. The cello is really sawing now and I'm headbanging in my quarantine. I am with her when she says there are some things that hurt deeply enough that other forms of experience and expression are obliterated altogether. It's part of what has brought me back to the album over and over again. And that's love's talent, really. Even an asshole can put you square in these crosshairs. Week two, week three. Never Two Weeks also captures some of the self-auditing that occurs in the midst of grief. Marika begins and Julia joins in. I might forgive if I could forget. I should let go, but I haven't yet. The corkscrewed feelings of the bridge ping between these subjunctives might and could and should finally landing on haven't, reminding us that grief tricks you into believing there's a right way to do it. But fuck it, let's be wrong and let's lean all the way into it. Save the platitudes for someone who won't call you out on them. Before Julia's transplant, she said that people like to say, oh, you're so strong, you'll beat this. And she wanted us to know, I'm paraphrasing, no, that's not true, that's fucked up. This is not up to me or my unique power. Strength and survival are not equivalencies. Like she says in the song, her power was jumping into something when no one else would, into projects, into deep feelings, into hearty snorting laughter, and into theory and pleasure. If you were brave, you followed her. If you weren't, you missed out. She often sang of death. Right now I'm thinking of dying dead, streets of tubing, and even heaven sitting down. But this is one of few songs where she sings about the desire for death as opposed to being caught in its processes. 
So let's get one thing queer. Desiring death isn't a diminishment of one's strength, and neither is being claimed by a death beyond one's control. The strings drop out briefly, and we just hear, I miss you so much, over drums, and return as the song ends on a resonant pull of the bow under Julia and Marika in unison singing, that don't make me too weak to be brave. If you were still here, I would send you this dialogue on shared witnessing between Patrick Otuma and Hanif Abdurraqib, where Hanif says, none of us are promised to find that thing that will lessen our suffering. And so to find that feels vital, to uplift it when you find it. In the song, that thing is your own ferocious practice of public vulnerabilities and in your life too. Even when you were scared, to be near you was to know what you were capable of. When I wrote this, it had been more than a month since your death, almost two months, never two months. As I read this today, it has been more than a year. Thank you. With a content warning, as part of uh, as part of this present uh, as part of this presentation, excerpts from media coverage depicting violence against Black, uh, specifically Black trans persons, will be read verbatim. This is intentional to underscore the grammars that were and still are utilized to narrate transphobic violence against Black persons. On Wednesday, October 28th, 1998, at approximately 9 p.m., 31-year-old Leonard Lynn Vines, a lifetime resident of Baltimore, walked onto the 200, uh, 200 block of Madeira Street in eastern Baltimore. He was going to pick up a key from his cousin's house. A large group of young men and women, perhaps 20 of them, were hanging out on the street. Leonard heard one of them say, Hey y'all, there's a drag queen faggot. One of the youths told Leonard that they didn't allow no uh, drag queen faggot bitches to come through the street. Leonard said he didn't want any trouble. While he was explaining that he was there to pick up, uh, pick up a key from his cousin to an apartment he was thinking of renting in the neighborhood, one of the youths struck him in the face. When Leonard repeated that he didn't want any trouble, Another one of the youths pulled out a gun and shot him six times, twice in the arm, twice in the chest, one in the back, and once in the shoulder. Then all of the youths sauntered off, leaving a seriously wounded and bleeding Leonard behind, uh, leaving uh, Leonard behind on his cousin's front stoop. This was taken from gendernews.com. The narrative offered above was one of many similar stories that would circulate through my, uh, through my information channels in 1998. I came to know about the queer bashing of Lynn Vines, uh, not, through the, usual, uh, not through, the, uh, through the usual channels like journalistic accounts through which one becomes aware of tragic violence or loss, but through a, uh, through a friend and activist colleague on campus that year, the murder of Matthew Shepard, a young gay male, just one month before, and the, lyn uh, the lynching of James Byrd in ja uh, Jasper, Te uh, Jasper, Texas, have brought hate crimes to the attention of the American public and beyond. Through the spectacularization of the Shepard Byrd cases in the media, hate crimes had come to be understood as reaching epidemic proportions, prompting demands for redress through federal legislation. In light of this epidemic, one might question why narratives of Vine's incident did not garner the same wide attention, uh, same uh, the same widespread attention within public discourse, but also pondering the lack of response from the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force at the time, many colleagues, uh, many colleagues of mine were prompted to ask with sincerity, do the lives of queers of, uh, queers of color matter? From the uh, from these uh, from the outset, this question 
and many others were ethical ones insofar as it is first presumed that a first, uh, we first presume that social hierarchies are implicated in the non-representation of violence against queers of color in public discourse. Thus, one remedy would appear to see uh, would appear to be uh, the diversica diversification of accounts of homophobic and transphobic violence within media outlets. More importantly, if such is the case, one must also grapple with the possibility that such strategies for forming the conditions of redress are themselves limited. With the latter in mind and a primary concern, a more pressing question for me at the time was are certain acts of violence unnarrativizable because the circumstances do not fall neatly within a preconceived narrative of what a hate crime indeed quote unquote looks like? How, for instance, does one account for an act of violence such as that inflicted upon vines that reveal the complex and contradictory mechanisms of racial and sexual objection that enable such violence to occur in the first place? In an attempt to explore these questions, this presentation examines the political investments of contemporary memorializing practices of queer loss, specifically though not limited to the realm of, cin uh, realm of cinema. How, for instance, do we uh, consider uh, such films as the Laramie Project based on, uh, based on Moises Kaufman's uh, play of the same name that operate as both a, mo a memorialization, but also as a political intervention? In tandem, how might we consider the web pages uh, consider web pages such as the now defunct Remembering Our Dead and, to, uh, and how they interrogate the parameters that determine whose lives are more readily grievable in conversations about hate crimes and the, def uh, and the terms of its def uh, definition. And here on, this, uh, here on the slide, uh, I'm highlighting uh, three films that came uh, came out roughly around the same time as conversations were happening in, uh, happening in Congress regarding hate crimes legislation. And so uh, a, bi a, a biopic made for Showtime, I believe, uh, called Jasper, Texas, that highlights uh, uh, what happened uh, to James Byrd and then the Laramie Project uh, that centers on how a theater troupe uh, tries to help a, uh, help a community heal and try to grapple with what happened to Matthew Shepard. And then subsequently there was a, a made for TV movie that aired on NBC starring uh, Sam Watterson and Stalker Channing, uh, the Matthew Shepard story, which dealt primarily more with uh, Matthew Shepard's interior life before the incident. And one of the things that were striking to me about this, these films and what I call uh, kind of the turn to mourning in queer cinema uh, is that ultimately both Jasper, Texas and the Laramie Project are engaged in a different kind of conversation around mourning uh, where the incident is understood as wounding the community, not just the person, uh, which, is very in, uh, which is very interesting in terms of community is understood very localized and very, uh, 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 very localized and specific to place. And so one of the, uh, one of the things that I was thinking through uh, as I wrote this paper some time ago uh, was what is to be said of those persons whose untimely deaths fall outside of a legible narrative of a hate crime, yet nonetheless are only intelligible by interrogating the historical legacies of racism and anti-Black racism specifically, <laughs> and trans or homophobia, specifically in uh, trans, and, uh, tra trans, and, uh, trans and homophobia, specifically in constituting a vulnerable social subject. But then I also ask now, if Lynn did not make the list, such as Remembering Our Dead hosted by Gender Pack, is this a sign of hope or erasure? That was then, and I'm realizing that I would ask a different set of questions now that still would not necessarily reach an answer. For instance, and I've had these conversations before, 
is part of the reason that certain incidents of hate crimes become uh, unnarrativizable as such, because we live in a, a, we live in a, a constant a, a continual mo continual moment where anti blackness frames black on black crime as as something as something pathological as something that is easily isolated as such, thus. Uh, to actually interrogate and hold accountable black on black trans or homophobic violence uh, would seem counterintuitive to some sort of movement toward black liberation. And we can talk, uh, we can talk about this in the Q&A. But another question that I'm asking now is what role does Hollywood cinema serve in processes of grieving and who is actually being addressed and invited to mourn. Or to echo Je uh, film scholar Jackie Goldsby reflecting on the new queer cinema in 1993, is documentary the only true form that can depict Black queer life? And here we have uh, on the left, uh, another Hollywood film, Boys Don't Cry, which documented uh, uh, the life, uh, the life and murder of Brandon Tina, and then on the right we have Dreams Deferred, the Sakia Gun uh, film project. Sakia uh, Gun uh, was uh, for all intents and purposes under uh, uh, identified as lesbian, but was gender non-conforming and was mur uh, was murdered by a black man. Uh, who uh, Sakia refused his advances. Uh, this happened in New Jersey, again, roughly around the same time frame. And so all of these different kinds of cinematic, rumin cinematic or filmic, filmic ruminations of these events have been kind of twirling in my mind for a long time. And so I want to turn now to thinking about uh, what is called a necrology and thinking about necrology as a method And so, in an attempt to answer some, uh, in, in an attempt to offer a provisional answer to some of these questions I've posited above, I take as a point of, uh, I want to kind of make a detour uh, to discuss the late Vito Russo's seminal film history, *The Celluloid Closet: Homosexuality in the Movies*, published in 1985. Russo's study, while primarily a history of cinematic representations of male homosexuality and homoeroticism, outlines the conditions under which representations of same-sex desire in Hollywood cinema operated within what Kara Keeling refers to as a regime of visibility. By indexing the various state-sanctioned prohibitions on such representations, Rousseau's, uh, Rousseau's study captures the cultural terrain that has come to structure the politicization of visibility in contemporary LGBT politics. Our primary concern here is not the study itself, but rather one of the appendices that is offered by Rousseau, the necrology, pages, 19, uh, pages 347 to 349. Comprising two pages near the end of his study, Rousseau provides a chronicle of the instances where queer or queered bodies are excised from the fabric of a given cinematic narrative through violent means. Rousseau's necrology is intentionally disturbing as we, the reader, are compelled to re-encounter classic films <clears throat> in a new light as they are no longer viewed as disparate incidents, uh, incidences, but rather as part and parcel of a tradition of symbolic violence. Representing a litany of sorts, the necrology underscores the ongoing and consistent trend across genres in Hollywood cinema to configure queer bodies as disposable bodies. Thus, it's fair to comprehend Rousseau's necrology as a political provocation. In this regard, film is considered by Rousseau as a site where social and cultural politics are literally rehearsed and dramatized. Little scholarly attention has been given to this aspect of Rousseau's study, with one exception. <clears throat> In his, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, just give me a moment. In his essay, The Spectacle of Mourning, Douglas Crimp mentions Rousseau's necro ne necrology only briefly, 
but his thoughts give us some insight into what we might imagine a necrology as doing or enacting. Krim's essay, while primarily concerned with the political efficacy of the Names Project, AKA the AIDS quilt, is equally concerned with the impossibility for such acts to move individ individuals towards political action and transformative social change. For her uh, perhaps somewhat cynical, Krimp writes that many in our society secretly want us dead is to me beyond question. And one expression of this may be our society's loving attention to the quilt, which is not only a reflection and representation of mourning, but also the stunning evidence of the mass, mass death of gay men. It would of course be unseemly for society to celebrate our deaths openly, but I wonder if the quilt helps make this desire decorous. Reading, Russo, uh, reading Russo's necrology is another example of stunning evidence of mass loss. Krimp's pro uh, Krimp prompts us to consider Russo's act as operating, operating within a complex affective economy of both mourning and rage. As with the AIDS quilt, our task with Russo's necro necrology would be to discern whom it seeks to address, or ultimately, whom do we imagine should be stunned? Considering that Rousseau's necrology is first and foremost a catalog, it operates within a familiar logic of quantifying incidents of violence so as to underscore the existence of a phenomenon. One comparable example of this would be the document, a documentation of lynching compiled by the NAACP in 1919, entitled 30 Years of Lynching in the United States, 1989 to 1918 as part of, uh, part of a broader political campaign to demand legislative me measures to address uh, racist violence in the United States in the post-emancipation era. Thus, it could be inferred that the accumulation of citations that Rousseau offers are intended to cajole or move one towards some sort of political action. Reckonings, flashback 2015, California State University. I'm invited to a conference uh, by a colleague of mine who teaches in the Department of Communications, uh, in particular, a graduate, con a graduate student conference that he's hosting. I've had a very rough year, but I said I wouldn't mind coming out to visit and I will attend the con conference. It'd be nice to be a member of the audience for a change. The theme of the conference that year was uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, primarily in response to uh, conversations that students were having uh, regarding George Zimmerman and his acquittal for the murder of uh, Trayvon Martin. And so uh, the context of the conference was very interesting considering that many of the students were coming from communication backgrounds. And so a lot of the conversation was in, in a lot of the conversation we guess, was deconstructing the meaning and the intention of what hashtag Black Lives Matter should mean. Uh, we can talk more about that in the Q&A as well. One of the keynote speakers, uh, Adriana Clay, a professor at San Francisco State, uh, professor at San Francisco State offer, uh, offered a wonderful keynote address that offered a genealogy of Black Lives Matter, uh, reminding folks in the room that Black Lives Matter uh, was created by folks that were coming from an intersectional uh, black feminist intersectional perspective that understood that all black lives matter. And yet we would see as black uh, as the hashtag gets taken up within public discourse. Uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, that is not necessarily the case. And so we end up having uh, other hashtags like save uh, say her name, uh, as well as <clears throat> Sorry, as well as uh, little, sorry, as well as uh, Black Trans Lives Matter. As part of the conference, there was a community panel entitled "Family Seeking Justice." The images that you see are uh, taken from an article called "Hashtag Black Lives Matter." 
more than just a hashtag that was published in the Pioneer at two, uh, in 2015. Um, and they were one of the media outlets that were covering the event. And as I'm, as I'm looking at these slides and I'm remembering, as I'm remembering my feelings in this conference, uh, and the ethicality of having these conversations while necessary as we talk so much about how uh, the academy must engage the community. I'm struck by what it is that is being asked of what became a panel of primarily mothers of lost uh, children lost to police violence in the Bay Area. Uh, both San Francisco and Oakland. In attendance, panelists included Oscar Grant's mother, Wanda Johnson, Alan Bluford's mother, Geraldine Bluford, James Rivera's mother, Dion Smith Downs, and Oscar Grant's uncle, Cephas, Uncle Bobby Johnson. Moderating the panel was Cap Brooks, co chair of the Onyx Organizing Committee. You can see her sitting in the middle on the uh, first photo on the left, and then uh, uh, later co uh, comforting the mother of James Rivera uh, during the Q&A. And I'm thinking, of, uh, and as this was happened, I'm thinking about uh, the kinds of conversations that were engendered that were painful, and thinking about the ways in which I'm questioning then and now uh, at what at what point is it unethical to ask someone to share your grief, especially to share their grief, especially within a con uh, within a very academic context? I was also taken aback by the fact that I was here present amongst uh, relatives of Oscar Grant, and during the panel. Uh, during the panel, Fruitvale Station, which documents uh, the murder of Oscar Grant by police in Oakland, uh, and asking, what does it mean when this conversation is happening six years after Grant's murder and two years since the release of Fruitvale Station? Did I know that, the do uh, that documentary would also be one of many alternative media forms to animate Say Her Name years later. In particular, the documentary Say Her Name, The Life and Death of Sandra Bland. What are the failures of narrative cinema in this moment then and now? Returning back to another question, if, I do, if, if someone does not make the list, does that necessarily mean that we cannot grieve or mourn what has happened or continues to happen to them? And so here I'm thinking, of C.C. McDonald, but I'm also thinking of uh, thinking of Mocha Dawkins in Toronto, and how the nar uh, the narrative regarding uh, regarding uh, violence against trans women has shifted to penalizing trans women for self uh, for defending themselves, and we see this also being documented within uh, the realm of documentary cinema, and so by way of closing. I kind of wanted, uh, kind of wanted to, just kind of briefly ruminate on uh, what I'm kind of calling the new queer thing, uh, because many would argue that what was dubbed the new queer cinema by B. Ruby Rich, uh, kind of emphasizing uh, a particular cultural moment in the late '80s to uh, late '80s into the '90s, and what does it mean now that uh, queer, vi uh, queer, uh, queer visibility and trans visibility is very prominent and then questioning and perhaps uh, I might end just with that question what does it mean now that we have this visibility what do we intend to do with it and how will we utilize it to get justice thank you um, I'll just jump right into it this is a Buddhist love letter to Hong Kong neither grasping nor abandoning neither impure nor pure not abandoning folks we've lost along the way. This paper is a vehicle for crossing the oceans of life and death. Tiu Dou is ultimately interested in the collective cultivation of bodhicitta, 
the mind that strives towards awakening, empathy, and compassion for the benefit of all sentient beings. This approach reframes wounds as opportunities to crack ourselves open in order to feel and remember the rage and sorrows of ghosts and hauntings. Buddhist teacher Susan Piver defines cracking open as thinking of all these tears as a flood of love. Liberated from its object, love now flows freely, powerfully, mercilessly, as rain, as sorrow, and as longing. When your heart is broken, it is broken open in some sense your limitations in love has been removed. All the love you had is still there, but instead of attaching to an object, it floats freely. It is groundless and without reference point. Let us not forget that the Hong Kong 2019 protests began with the death of Lan Wing Kit, the first haunting that marked and transformed capitalist shopping mall Pacific Place into a funeral site, with his death note written specifically that it is the Hong Kong government accelerating his personal will because his heart has turned gray and intentions have turned cold. As Avery F. Gordon would put it, when disturbed feelings cannot be taken away, when something else, something different from before, seems like it must be done, such needs conveniently brushed away by the jury as dying as misadventure or accident. Our psychic lives have long been intertwined. During the protests, dreaming, Fat Mung, was dreamed as a euphemism in digital spaces for protesters who wished to describe their plans and actions, while staying anonymous under criminalizing laws, censorship, and police brutality. Our dreams are similar, consisting of tear gases and police batons. Some dreamed of acting as first aid, some dreamed of the raptors, some jot down gears to equip, and others agreed upon when to dream together next time. Transcending the boundary between imagination and reality, suspending our judgments on what's abstract or concrete, collectively reading about others' dreams as the manifestation of our and their subconscious desires. In this way, we may have acted as a common fate body, elaborated by activists Edward Learn and Brian Learn. Years have passed since then. How are we to reconcile with having had our dream states once so intimately stitched together with psychological education now trying to correct incarcerated folks' pathologized, polarized thinking? In racial melancholia, racial dissociation, the dangers of psychoanalysis are pointed out, exclusively focusing on the mother, but rarely considering the motherland, attuning to family dynamics, but rarely thinking about the family of nations. When nationalist education blends with legitimizing parental governance within the nuclear family structure, Professor Ting Guo calls out Chief Executive Carrie Lam for appropriating the Confucian parent official model, daring to pose as the mother of all Hong Kong citizens. It seems that we require vocabulary to describe the violence and of infantilization occurring in the name of pacification and love. This is the reason the essay title puts love in quotations, divesting from fabricating and manipulating the idea of love, presenting Buddhist alternatives as a means to assemble the common fate body. Not impure. At some point, we stopped dreaming. What could be too unrealistic to dream about? With bodhicitta, Buddhists and bodhisattvas dream of liberating others from the cyclical existence of metaphorical literal sex realms, gods, demigods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, and hells to reach nirvana. This process is often uh, compared with extinguishing fires. Fires were indeed involved when the slogan, if you burn, if we burn, you burn with us, emerged out of the protests representing the stance of more radically militant Yongmo protesters. As consensus around means of revolutionizing cannot be agreed upon, another phrase indicating the non-separation of the harmonist and the militant, Wo Yongba Fan, was elaborated. But in reality, how have we dealt with our different stances and roles? How have we facilitated the inclusion of individuals and social groups whose suffering has been existent even before the 2019 protest? Have the protests ended yet? Or could we prolong them through empathizing with each other's suffering, through the never-ending expansion of our common fate body? After all, the Kila Chongyalpa calls out Darwin's theory of evolution for being incomplete, that survival of the fittest is merely one stage of the evolutionary cycle and cannot work without intra and interspecies cooperation. As a field conservationist, she has noticed resilience within ecosystems is the byproduct of building community around the precept of interdependence. Much like trees pushing nutrients through their root systems to help other trees recover, might we also be inspired by the way nature works? There are disembodied digital voices of disagreement with John Solomon's A Genealogy of the Defeat of the Left, Translation, Transition, and Bordering in Hong Kong in Tong San Book's comment section. Some claim it feels like being forced to admit defeat. He is loyal to China and CCP is, is extremely left. So how has the left been defeated? A bunch of left hearts that only fight for the spotlight, dragging other people and objects down, publishing books again to harm people? We see the after effects of Hong Kong people being politically stuck between two colonizers, having muddled conceptions of what the left even means, unable to distinguish if one is dictated, harmed, or led by its ideologies.
Apart from being separated by political stances, Buddhism also suggests that all things are conditioned, constructed, or fabricated, sankhara. The term points towards co-doings, combined forces like compounds and synergies, but ultimately are impermanent, so ever-changing that there can hardly be solidified an inherent state and hardly be controlled by any individual. In this way, intersubjectivities are imposed to construct the real world, Grieving our eventual cessation, decay, and inability to have control, Ajahn Chah, a meditation teacher, once compared our state to a fragile glass of water. One day, an elbow or a strong wind will certainly knock it over. It is already broken. We can therefore use it in fearless freedom. Grieving, no matter pre or post-traumatic, acknowledging the inevitability of suffering, frees us from existential anxiety and uncertainty, allowing us to cherish each encounter as another precious expression of goodbye. What if we reframe defeats as opportunities to listen to each other closer? Not pure, if nature is unjust, change nature. What does it mean when personal grieving rituals can be criminalized for eventually accumulating to a status that would violate national security law? Let's explore the narrative that on June 4th, 1989, nothing happened, quote. This year on June 4th though, more than a hundred policemen were guarding Victoria Park against illegal gatherings. Mr. Song alone put down an umbrella and two electric candles on the ground while reading a book about the history of, history of modern mind. He replied no comment when he was asked by the police why he had come to visit and kept reading in the rain. Afterward, he told the journalist that a one person mind also has its own uniqueness. Art as trial and error gives us an idea of what reactions can escape from being policed. On the same day in the same district, other artists were skinning potatoes, biting weeds while lying on the ground, and interacting with pedestrians through math questions that at the answer is 8964. While I have been doing research in medieval China, Michelle Strickman wrote that there is embarrassment among modern scholars who attempt to interpret Chinese religion through the boundaries and lenses of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, especially when they have to deal with the cult of the dead, ancestor worship, and degenerate cults. With the police arresting Chan Mei Tong, the artist experimenting with potatoes for misconduct in public places, we must ask how this nameless religion centered around grief is continually silenced and threatened. As activist Lo Yop Lin holds three bundles of white chrysanthemums near the liaison office of the central people's government, around 50 policemen were on guard and some warned her that her actions might be against the Hong Kong national security laws. She cried and asked what crime is committed through grieving on June 4th while wearing a Buddhist t-shirt printed with Namo Amitabha. Policemen warned paper mache offering shops not to sell her underworld currency and clothes, said, said silent tribute is okay, but burning outside the liaison office would definitely be committing a crime and said, I'm genuinely convincing you out of kindness. Let's go have a meal, don't go burn stuff. If nothing really happened, how do we explain the surrounding paranoia, the bonds being formed and fragmented in silence? How may grief broken down into individuals miming flow have death and disappearances become too burdensome for language to even contain and how else might we break the illusions of police purity? Not grasping, don't be what they made you. What makes someone a Hong Konger? A passport? Buddhism teaches that name and form are but one chain of dependent origination, contributing to the arising and cessation of phenomena, inherently empty and unstable. Just as if you remove the gears of a car one by one, you would reach a point where it can hardly be called a car anymore. We must ask what is special about our lived experiences together that bounds us together by a common name and explore if it could go beyond circumstances and frameworks about birth. With the understanding that everything is conditioned and even what makes us happy momentarily could turn into suffering when we lose touch eventually, Buddhism encourages us to cultivate a special sense of solitude, achieving the state of no bitterness, no pleasure, nothing not bitter, nothing not pleasure. Seeing through that even the label we hold precious could contribute to drawing lines between insider versus outsider, we could choose to betray any group, and that could very well make us the ones that refuse to take a seat at oppressors' tables, ones that give up on representation and respectability politics, ones that are disloyal to any colonizer's mentalities, including our own internalized tendencies. The 2019 protests were known for their approach of being water, as inspired by martial artist Bruce Lee, telling us to empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. With no representation for a negotiation table, abandonment of a single occupation strategy, dispersing, reliance on higher security apps like Telegram, democratic polls online, it could have been a peak time period of ambiguously playful queer Asia, resisting essential determinism and an analytical closure. 
In the November 2021 Sinophone and Hong Kong Studies Seminar, I suggested that we rethink the word citizenship as in being a literal ship immersed with water. To echo the settler colonial idea of authors that night, Hong suggesting that Hong Kong people could mass migrate to a United Kingdom colonized island in South America. Haunting always harbors the violence, the witchcraft and denial that made it, and the exile of our longing, the utopian. Yet what happens when our utopic visions are merely duplicates of how we have been colonized? Another utopian slogan that emerged from the 2019 protests was do not split, but God said, discouraging the drawing of boundaries between one another, especially when there was a trend of catching ghosts, the act of accusing those who want to start riots as undercover police, conflicting when radically militant protesters wish to adopt violent means for protest too. In this case, I am interested in not splitting even among the dead and alive. While searching for Buddhist teachings on being as fluid as water, I found a quote concerning the state of Lok Chen being, Knowing all illusory thinking self arises and ceases, there is no need for remediation and they are not continuous, like drawing pictures on water, bird marks in the sky, born but as if unborn, originally free. If we perceive ourselves more as moving images, raw discontinuous footage existing without need for mental editing, beings greater than terms may frame us, anti-essentially believing that none of our inborn characteristics define us because of how ever-changing we are, we might finally find ourselves freed from post-colonial identity crisis, only ever able to submit before learning, trying to mimic unbroken English, be given a voice before one can speak, just as winning poet Eric Yip wrote. I have walked us through four negations of thinking and feeling through Hong Kong's hauntings in the social sphere from 2019 and onwards, highlighting both the importance of alienation and interdependence, of imagining beyond notions of pure or impure. Simultaneously attached and empty, we could form kinship systems beyond identification through continual expansion of our common fate body and body chica, disrupting established boundaries. While as colonized migrants, we are being challenged to become post-loyalists, having to find a remedy for grief over loss of culture and losing touch with times. Perhaps we are also blessed with the knowledge that visions, uh, that nation state and prom that nation state promises and even dharmic laws are like what the Diamond Sutra says, like dreams, fantasies, bubbling shadows, like dew and like lightning, illusory non static scenery. More attention has to be put into the absent, neglected, ghostly, if we are to continue Sinophone studies in interrogating the definition of Chineseness, including zooming into the very ways Hong Kong people have been complicit in reinforcing current governance, including permissions and prohibitions, division of people according to belief systems, instead of acknowledging common suffering as being dehumanized together. It is hoped that this text and others in the future may continue to take us crossing oceans of life and death as we use ghostly encounters and tracking their silent screams as research methodology and an ethics of care. Thank you.